Welcome to the Modern Law Library. I'm your host, the ABA Journal's Lee Rawls, and today I'm here with the authors of the book, Prison by Any Other Name, The Harmful Consequences of Popular Reforms. Maya Chenoir and Victoria Law are joining us. Thank you guys so much for uh, being on this podcast. Thanks for having us. So I'd like to hear from both of you a little bit about your backgrounds and how you came to work together on this book. Maya, do you want to go first? Sure. So for me, this topic was both professional and personal, and I got particularly interested in covering prisons when my sister was first incarcerated 15 years ago in juvenile detention, and she just cycled in and out of prisons and jails, and also some of these popular alternatives that we examine in our book, like electronic monitoring, mandatory drug treatment, mandatory mental health treatment, and others. I got to this point by watching her over the years, living with her experience and our family's experience, and realizing these alternatives were not working. And Vicki and I had been talking about working on a project together, and Vicki can talk a little more about her path, but our interests kind of converged in this subject matter. Both of us had been writing about prisons for a very long time, and this seemed like the obvious next step. As both liberals and conservatives were talking about prison reform, many of the alternatives they were proposing kind of fell in this category of other ways to cage people. So that's where our interests converged, and we decided to write this book together. And Victoria? So my trajectory was a little different than Maya's. I definitely had some previous experience with the criminal legal system. I, When I was in high school, I went to one of the high schools that we would now term a school to prison pipeline high school in which it was mostly black and brown and immigrant students from low income families in a low income community. There were metal detectors. There were not a lot of, it was overcrowded. There was not a lot of individualized attention given to students, and there were police in the schools. And it was a perfect recruiting ground for gang members. And one by one and two by two, my friends joined gangs, dropped out of high school, and were arrested for a gang-related activity. At one point, I was swept up in some of this teenage ridiculousness, and I was arrested for armed robbery. And New York State is one of two states that automatically charged 16-year-olds as adults in the criminal court system. And because I am, because of my ethnicity and my size and my gender, I was actually allowed to plead to youthful offender status and given a probation sentence. And probation, when I was growing up, was a lot different than probation now with all of the monitoring and the restrictions. And this alternative to incarceration actually then was not the same pathway that sets people up to fail. So it allowed me to finish high school. It allowed me not to go to prison. It allowed me to go to college. It allowed me to eventually finish college uh, and you know move on with my life. And at the same time, I started also reporting on what was happening inside prisons, which is how I met Maya. Fast forward to maybe 2015. 2014, Maya and I were noticing a disturbing trend in which the right and the left were coming together to talk about prison reform and reducing prison populations. But what they were talking about were shifting populations from the actual brick and mortar prisons and jails to other forms of coercive control, such as electronic monitoring, such as probation, which I had been on. But a more invasive type of probation for actions that may not necessarily have warranted any type of coercive control before the advent of technology and the expansion of the prison nation. We were seeing that schools were increasingly mimicking prisons in some communities. We were seeing other institutions such as child welfare agencies also put obstacle after obstacle in front of families that were trying to stay together in the same ways that the prison and the prison nation also does. So we decided that we wanted to look at some of these 
popular reforms that were being put forth as alternatives to prisons so that 20 years from now, we're not looking at the same type of monster, just in a different set of clothing. In some ways, this seems like a really ideal time for this book to come out, given that we hear a lot more discussion about police abolition, prison abolition, Mm -hmm. police reform, prison reform, all of these things. And there were some misconceptions I had that your book really did correct, ideas that I thought, oh, in the abstract, this seems like a reasonable alternative. And it was helpful reading the descriptions of you guys going into it and saying, well, here are the other things you need to think about. I know that one thing that the ABA in particular has been advocating for is for courts to stop giving really onerous fees and for bail to be set in amounts that don't allow people to be out of jail while while their cases are pending and things like this. What are some of the most common, sounds like a good idea, but turns out there's a dark side, suggestions you routinely hear from people who are interested in reforming the system? When I was writing my last book, which was about prison more broadly, and what was wrong with it, A lot of the people that I spoke with about the book said, of course, of course, prison is torturous and we shouldn't be mass incarcerating people. Instead, we should be putting them in treatment since so many people in prisons and jails are either diagnosed with mental illness or they're struggling with a drug addiction. And I think that for me, this is the most common misconception is, well, you just have to put people someplace else. And and that's one of the themes of our book is this idea that replacement is the key. We just have to come up with another monolithic institution that can replace prison. We can put people there instead. And there are a couple of problems with this. One is that it's unethical. The idea that we should just be able to manipulate people's bodies and go against their will in order to treat them because we think it's a good idea. I think there are some ethical problems on its face. Another is that it doesn't work. So mandatory drug treatment, mandatory mental health treatment, even by the system's own standards, the research shows that that this is not actually an effective way of helping people overcome problems. And another, I think, and this is complicated for me because my sister actually was in drug court a few months ago when she died, but I think that we like to think that an abstinence-only environment where you're just giving people enough rules and regulations is the route to helping them because We live inside of the system. We live inside of this carceral system that says, oh, you know, the legal system should be dealing with drug problems. The legal system should be dealing with what we're calling mental illness. So, of course, there must be some solution that's based around rules and restrictions. And at the time that my sister died, she was in a program that mandated abstinence because that was part of her drug court sentence, and it was also part of the probation rules that she was following. People on probation are following a very long list of rules, sometimes over 20. The average, I think, is somewhere in the mid-teens. And so she was following all these rules, following all these regulations. She left her mandatory treatment facility, and she immediately overdosed because her tolerance had been lowered so much by going through this abstinence-only program. And this is actually fairly common. And so by thinking about all these public health problems within the context of the legal system, we're following this faulty logic of replacement and we're saying, oh, you know, we just, we're still going to sentence people, we're still going to put people through the courts, We're still going to base our solutions on rules, restrictions, confinement, control, but it's just going to be a nicer place that we put them, a place where they have counselors in charge instead of prison guards, a place where they are 
forced to go to treatment groups instead of forced to sit in a cell all day. And research shows us and our personal experiences show us this is not the solution. Well, first off, I want to say I'm so sorry for your loss. Are there alternatives that have shown better results? Uh, I, I know that a lot has changed since the things we were told in the 90s and the 2000s. I remember of family friends who were going through a tough time with their teen child. And the, and the advice was to literally send a group to kidnap him and take him to a camp in the desert, essentially. And I do hope that we've advanced past that. What have been some good alternatives? Well, I think one of the, perhaps not a monolithic alternative, but a question to always ask is, you know, what resources and supports do people need? Because as somebody who was on probation in the 1990s, I was again, because of my ethnicity, the fact that I was a small Asian woman, was largely left alone. And I was not given the same laundry list of requirements that Maya's sister, 20 years later, you know, was handed and was threatened with incarceration if she broke any of these regulations. So sometimes it might say, well, what do people need? And maybe the answer is maybe they just need to be left alone because teenagers are very impulsive and we understand now that their brains are not fully developed and kidnapping them and separating them from their families and their loved ones and their communities is not necessarily going to help them thrive in the world. It's going to teach them that if you do something and you get caught, you are going to be punished by being torn away from your family. And then you're going to come back at a certain point and you're going to have to try to fit back in with all the trauma of being taken away. So perhaps the better question would be, what resources and supports do people need? Both the people who have been harmed if somebody has been harmed by somebody else's action and the people who did the harm. So... I think that that is something to think about. And then how do we move towards that point? So it could start very small. We interviewed Rachel Herzing, one of the co-founders of Critical Resistance, who organized a project called Building the Block, in which she organized within an Oakland neighborhood where people got together and they started brainstorming what kinds of resources they had They would allow them to rely on each other rather than calling the police for any given action. And this was not necessarily somebody is being murdered, let's not call the police, but what are the small things in our lives that we can start by uh, saying, like, how do we as a community address this? Somebody always has loud Friday night parties. How do we as a community address this? Something, you know, somebody else is maybe food insecure. How do we as a community address this? So what are the small ways in which we can interact with each other without calling in the state. And then from there, we can work towards building safety by building relationships. You had a great anecdote. I think it was towards the end of the book where someone had spoken to a a coffee shop owner about the idea of creating a safe space. Victoria or Maya, do do one of you want to share that story? So uh, in New York, in central Brooklyn and the Crown Heights area, it is largely an Afro-Caribbean neighborhood. So there's a lot of people of color. There's a lot of violence by police. So it's a neighborhood which is often over-policed and policed excessively. And people in the neighborhood know that calling the police does not necessarily equate safety. At the same time, there was also a lot of homophobic and transphobic violence happening in that community. And There is an organization called the Audre Lorde Project, which works specifically with people of color who are LGBTQ, and they started a program called the Safe Outside the System program, in which they were developing means of community safety, again, without understanding that the police were not people who would be able to provide safety. And there was a murder of a young gay man in the neighborhood. And that galvanized them to start holding community meetings. So I want to stress that abolition is a process. If we're talking about 
having a world in which we don't need to rely on police for safety. It's not an overnight process. It's not a, you know, we pluck out the prisons and we put in another gigantic block where that hole is. So they started holding community meetings and they started brainstorming what would safety look like if you are LGBTQ in a neighborhood that is not always friendly to people who are LGBTQ or to have residents who are not always friendly to LGBTQ people. And what they came upon finally was the Safe Neighborhoods campaign, where businesses on the ground floor, or on the street level, places that you might pass on a regular basis, would be invited to participate in this campaign in which employees and owners would be trained in de-escalation techniques. They would be trained to spot homophobic and transphobic statements and actions that might seem minor but could escalate into violence and would learn how to de-escalate these things. So say if somebody is running a pizzeria and they notice that a table full of young people are harassing a visibly queer or visibly trans person sitting at another table... They would be taught how to recognize that as something that could escalate, not just, oh, kids are being kids. It's just words. You know, I don't need to be involved. But to say like, hey, that's not okay. We don't tolerate this here in ways that would deescalate and bring this down before the situation could escalate. And then they would also be given posters to put on their shop front windows to basically indicate that they were they would be a safe space for people who are trying to escape threats of violence. So imagine walking down the street and seeing and thinking that somebody is following you or maybe somebody is following you and they're saying things to you and you're feeling more and more threatened and you know that there are three shops on that block that you can go into and the person will lock the door and help you perhaps call your friends or call home and help you stay safe. So one of the founders of the Safe Neighborhoods campaign, Ajiris Dixon, recalled an instance in which she was going around to different businesses and saying, you know, will you be part of the Safe Neighborhoods campaign? And she would explain what the program was, talk about de-escalation, leave materials, try to get people to sign up for the de-escalation trainings. And she went to one coffee shop. And at the end of their conversation, the coffee shop owner was really not that on board. She said, well, you know... I like you, but I don't really like gay people. So she wasn't really that interested in participating. So Idiris left her the materials and her phone number and said, well, if you change your mind, you know, let me know and moved on. And she thought, well, this is not going to be a business that participates. And maybe a month later or so, the coffee shop owner called her and said, hey, I safe space today. Then she asked, is it okay if I didn't know if the person was gay? And Ajira said, (laughs) yes, this is amazing. And the coffee shop owner explained that she saw a young woman outside who was being harassed by some men. And it looked like the woman was not safe. So the coffee shop owner went outside, invited the woman into her coffee shop, locked the door, and helped her call people to make sure that she could get home safely. And that was it. And this evolved not from any sort of like huge revelation, but from the understanding that safety sometimes is small things like, hey, are you okay? Do you want to come sit in my coffee shop? Can we call somebody? And it opened the pathway to possibility for this owner who originally hadn't been very interested in this at all. But when the time came to actually act on this and help somebody get to safety, she did. One of the other elements you talk about in the book, which really hit home for me because of a specific experience I had in my community, was the chapter on child welfare. First of all, I had no idea how widespread child welfare investigations have gotten. You had a statistic in your book that I found pretty stunning. I think that it was more than 30% of children will experience some sort of DCFS investigation before they turn 18. And for African-American children, it rises to more than half, something like 53%. So Maya, can you explain how we got to this point and what 
child welfare systems and investigations look like currently? It's, like you said, much, much more widespread than a lot of people realize and has expanded so much in the last few years, partially as a result of mandated reporting. But one of the really interesting things about the child welfare system is, like a lot of the other elements and practices we're talking about in our book, it started out as a reform. So it started out as a reform that was supposed to help people, ostensibly, mostly at the time, including white people. But in reality, even at the beginning, it was heavily targeting poor parents, disabled parents. It was always oppressive in one way or another. But it truly evolved into a system of punishment, I think, and really expanded as it began to mostly target Black and Native families. This system expanded alongside incarceration. So mass incarceration, I think, has become much more well-known over the last few years. But this is a system that expanded right alongside it the the same stretch of decades in the 80s and 90s. And as this system expanded and focused more and more on Black and Native families, it increasingly focused on removing children from their homes, investigating families very intensely and invasively, and removing children. And I think here it's really important to look at the work of scholars and activists like Dorothy Roberts, who we interviewed for our book, and also Charity Tolliver, because they talk about how in so many ways this system replicates the patterns of slavery. And I think this country still carries a vestige of that assumption that taking away Black children from their mothers and their caregivers is okay and maybe even a positive thing for the child. And Miriam Cabo talks about this in our book as well. And Black children are disproportionately targeted and represented in the foster care system. So the foster care system is a legacy of slavery. It's also a legacy of Indigenous genocide. Colonization has always included settlers taking Native children and forcing them to assimilate. And we talk in our book a little bit about how foster care has evolved to kind of parallel that that practice. I think that it's important to, to put that in context and then look at how it's playing out currently. So we've got these ever-expanding mandatory reporting laws where it started out that doctors were mandated reporters and social workers were mandated reporters, teachers. And now in many states, it's expanded so that everyone's a mandated reporter. <laughs> Um, And more and more states are passing these laws, and they're not just conservative or liberal, they're seen as protecting children. And so in many cases, they're proposed by, by people who are very progressive. And I think it's 18 states now, everyone is a mandated reporter, which means that if you see something that you suspect might be child neglect or abuse, which of course is influenced by people's assumptions around race and ca- class, then you have to report it to Child Protective Services. And so we're, we're turning friends and families and neighbors into police who are, <laughs> who are effectively supposed to watch each other's parenting and turn them into authorities. And I think one element of this that's really important to lift up is what does neglect mean? So most most child welfare cases are about neglect. They're not about abuse. Mm-hmm. And neglect often means the kid is not seen to be having adequate clothing or shelter or food or something that involves resources. Maybe three kids are sleeping in the same room. And so these things are all considered neglect. And in a different type of society, in the kind of abolitionist society that that we're dreaming of, the response to that would be, okay, how can we support you in caring for your kids? 
How can we support you in providing enough food? How can we support you in providing adequate shelter, clothing, the, the time to make sure that, that you're able to spend enough time with your children, all of these things. And of course, instead, the response in our society is, is largely punitive, taking away people's children. And I mentioned that I had experienced in my community when I was in uh, high school and college, I worked for a place called the Crisis Nursery. And this is something that I had assumed was nationwide, but it, but is not. But just to explain to my listeners what this this was and is, it still exists. The Crisis Nursery was open 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. It took children from birth through the age of five. And essentially, if you needed child care, emergency child care, you could bring your child to the crisis nursery. Mm -hmm. And first off, any family of any demographic can have a crisis. You can be, uh, you know, traveling through a distant state and get in a car accident. And maybe mom and dad are injured, but the children aren't. Where do the children stay until family members can come pick them up? Or you have a job interview and it's last minute and no one else can want your children. All right, we'll bring them by. And sometimes this was uh, perhaps a child would stay overnight or for several days if they were looking for a foster care placement, something like this. But one of the other programs was for single parents who needed support. You know, let's say you are already dealing with the child welfare authorities and they say mm -hmm. to you, you need to have this apartment much cleaner and we're going to come by and inspect it in four days. And you have five children. <laughs> How do you clean an apartment? with five children in it mm -hmm. while the five children are still there. So we would do respites where, say, every two weeks, you bring your children by, they would play with the other children, we would show them movies, they had their own bed, things of this nature, and then you would come pick them up again. And, you know, I don't have access to statistics, and I was essentially a teenager when I was working for them. But that became such an important service. And it wasn't, as I said, only people who were in straightened circumstances or the demographics that we would expect, you know, my minority or poor who needed that support. And it was so integral to the community. So I'm just putting that out there. I hope that perhaps there are listeners out there who can look into something like that as community support for parents. But that is something that I saw with my own eyes have a real difference in, in families' lives. Sometimes you just need someone who can keep your child in a safe place for 24 hours while you get out of a bad situation. Wow. I want that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it should be everywhere. <laughs> but yeah, that's the Crisis Nursery mm -hmm. in Champaign-Urbana, Illinois. Shout out to them. To really switch gears here, and I think this is especially hitting home for me as a reader now, having spent the last three months, four months entirely in my home. And for my listeners, we are recording this on June 26th. A lot has been changing from day to day and week to week. So just to let you know, we're speaking to you from the past. But this idea of house arrest, you start out the book with a story of a woman who's a mother, she has two young children, and she's told essentially, the way that you can not spend the next several weeks in jail away from your children is to agree to house arrest. What does house arrest actually look like for the people who are experiencing it right now? So for people who are experiencing house arrest, it is very different than being sheltered at home. First of all, house arrest is often accompanied by electronic monitoring, which means that you have an actual physical device usually a big bulky ankle bracelet shackled to your ankle. And it's a GPS device which tracks all of your movements. So a probation officer or an electronic monitoring agency can actually see whether or not you're leaving your house and where you're going and if you've gotten permission. So you cannot leave your house without prior permission. So there are certain places that you can and cannot go or certain boundaries that you can and cannot go towards. So if you live in an urban area, it might be that you cannot leave past 100 feet past your apartment door. 
your apartment, not your apartment building, but your apartment, which might mean that you can't go downstairs to do laundry. If you live in a neighborhood that has more space, you might be able to go to your yard, but you cannot cross the street to go, say, drop your child off with a neighbor. You would have to wait for the neighbor to come to your house to be able to get your child. Uh, you would have to get prior permission, usually one week in advance, to do basic tasks like go grocery shopping, drop your children off at school, go to parent-teacher conference, and every movement is tracked. And the probation officer or parole officer or electronic monitoring agency, it differs from place to place as to who you have to ask, can also say no. We don't think that's important. So say in Olympia, Washington, one person we interviewed was able to go grocery shopping once a week, but was only allowed to go to one store during that once a week grocery trip. And he had to submit which store he was going to in advance. So if he went to the supermarket and they didn't have everything he needed, he was not allowed to go to the supermarket half a mile away and pick up the rest of the toilet paper, milk, eggs, diapers, whatever else he, he and his household might need. He would have to then return straight home and somebody else would have to go get these. So it is basically being trapped in your house and needing prior permission for every movement outside of your house with the threat of prison if you do not comply. There is, it really did make mm -hmm. me rethink how I have been experiencing yes. shelter-in-place laws when I thought about, oh, no, someone is tracking you to that extent. One of the people you brought up, her dumpster mm -hmm. to her building yes. was too far away. She literally could not take her trash out. Yes. And I was like, oh, you are in luxurious circumstances <laughs> in this shelter-in-place. Mm -hmm. But it really was mind-expanding, I would say, when I heard all of the restrictions. I know that one of the things a lot of advocates are desperately trying right now to do is, as we know, prisons are absolute hellholes when it comes to COVID-19. Mm -hmm. They're very, very dangerous places. And there is an effort to get as many people out and into safe seclusion away from COVID as possible. And I certainly have been in favor of that. And, was, and when home arrest is, is brought up as the alternative, that made sense. And then I read this book and I was like, oh, it really, it really is not how I had been thinking about it. And especially with the privatization of a lot of these services, it seems really, I was, I was very surprised by reading some of the things in this book. Could you talk about the privatization and the private companies that do this monitoring or, you know, do probationary monitoring. We just had a report come out from the ABA saying that privatizing these services really does hurt people's appreciation for the justice system or trust in the justice system at all. What did you find when you were doing your research for this book when it came to privatizing these services? Well, so first of all, I'll say that even outside of the privatization element, money is is so central to some of these alternatives, like financial motivations, including electronic monitoring, which is often promoted as this really financially savvy solution, because not only are you removing people from prisons and jails, where you have to pay for their food and pay for their health care and all of these things, you take them out of there, you don't have to provide any support on those fronts, and you can charge them. And this is true in, in many, many places, is people are actually paying for their own confinement on electronic monitoring, whether or not it's a private company in charge. And so it's that's, I think, another punishment <laughs> heaped on top. You, you spoke earlier about fines and fees. And this is something that we're seeing actually one of the people that we interviewed for our book couldn't get off of electronic monitoring because she couldn't afford to pay the fees. And they told her, well, you have to catch up with your payments. Otherwise, you're just like indefinitely on this electronic shackle. And so we see this, this financial motivation playing into this situation really insidious ways. So electronic monitoring, obviously, there are these companies that have 
marketed these devices and definitely have a stake in expanding the system. But on top of that, we're also seeing privatized probation, which has become increasingly common in this country. And it's many of the same corporations actually that run private prisons, which have gotten so much attention. And when you're on privatized probation, you're making regular payments. Even though you don't necessarily have a device on you, you're basically paying for the privilege of being on probation. And in these situations, often we're talking about people who've been convicted of very minor offenses, which is why they're not in jail or prison. But if they don't pay these fees to this private company, they could actually end up in jail. And so in some ways, probation becomes a driver of incarceration. In fact, in the Harvard Kennedy report that we cite in our book, they talk about the biggest alternative to incarceration, which is probation, is actually its biggest driver. (laughs) And I think it's 15% of people who are incarcerated were previously on probation. I have to double check that. But it's It's a driver of incarceration, but at the same time, cities are seeing private probation as a cost-saving measure, and it's becoming very popular because these private companies aren't charging governments, they're charging individuals to pay for their own punishment. And to me, I just, I don't see how this isn't just a futuristic debtor's prison. Right, exactly. (laughs) And one of the things that you you just brought up is this idea of, well, once you're in this path, once you are part of the system, there just is no feasible way for you to get out of it. And what I found really alarming, and Victoria, I'm going to point this one at you, is talking about the way we have turned our schools into prisons and the way we have basically set up our children in the school-to-prison pipeline There are so many infractions that can get them caught in the clogs of this system we have built. And it's just, it's so, so alarming. Uh, I would say if anyone is reading, reading this book, that's a harrowing chapter. So Victoria, could you talk a little bit about the difference between what we may have experienced as, as children in school and what is currently happening now? So when we talk about the school to prison pipeline, we need to understand that there are are certain schools in which students are treated as if they are in prison or they're being groomed groomed to go to prison. And what we're seeing in those schools, which are mostly schools in low income communities of color, black, brown, immigrant communities, is that there are often heavier handed policing tactics. So say two people get into a fight. It may not even be, it may be a physical fight. It might be a couple of slaps. It might be, you know, something that is just a verbal altercation. In many suburban affluent communities, that would be a trip to the principal's office. That would be a talking to. That would perhaps be detention. In schools that are in low-income communities of color, that could be school police arresting them. That could be school police taking this opportunity to do what police, we've seen police all across the country do, which is brutally stopping the fight by attacking students. We could we could see this as suspending students, making them miss school, you know, and staying home. We see this as ways in which students are criminalized for behaviors that don't need to be criminalized and should not be criminalized. We see students of color not getting the same opportunities for a second chance or the idea that kids are kids and they do silly things. Sometimes they do harmful things to other people. And we recognize that children have not fully formed brains, not great decision-making skills yet, and sometimes have impulse control. But in some schools particularly those in low-income communities of color. And even in the schools, which are in more affluent white communities, these same policies and practices target the few students of color who are there. So we've also interviewed students who were one of the handful of black or brown students in a more affluent white school, and they would be the ones targeted by school safety officers slash school police as 
people who were suspects when anything went wrong, if, say, a calculator went missing, they would be targeted for investigation. And investigation would not be being called into the teacher's office or the principal's office and saying, Jimmy, did you take Johnny's calculator? It would be, in one case, police actually going and busting into somebody's house when he was trying to eat breakfast with his grandmother on the pretext that they thought he had stolen a calculator. So if we look at this kind of policing and terror that is inflicted on particular students, we can see the same ways in which it mimics the ways in which policing happens to people of color and other marginalized people on the outside. There was a headline that was circulating recently on Twitter And I think it actually turns out it was from a 2014 story, but it was L.A. schools police will return grenade launchers, but keep rifles. And it was this story about how the school police department had gotten grenade launchers and an armored vehicle from, you know, a military uh, surplus military equipment sale. And that is stunning when you see efforts from around the country aimed at removing police from schools. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that is all it will take or are there going to be additional things needed for us to take back the environment of schools from this highly policed place that they currently are in? I think that that's a start. Like take these militarized police out of schools. We're seeing different jurisdictions talking, uh, passing resolutions to take police out of their school systems. So take the Minneapolis Police Department out of the school system. They don't need to be policing children. They don't, like children should be going to school and not worrying about being handcuffed. They should go to school and not worry about being attacked by school police officers. And at the same time, there needs to be a change in mindset. So what we're seeing is a mindset in which people are being punished for any infraction or perceived infraction of the rules. And those in, and the perceived infraction could be somebody thought you were talking back or because of the color of your skin, you are seen as more loud and more aggressive. So therefore, anything that you say or do is viewed with more suspicion and fear than if your white counterpart is doing the same thing. So it it's a good first step, but there also needs to be a lot done to change the punitive mindset of how we deal with conflicts in schools and also how we deal with race and racism in schools as well. Well, Maya and Victoria, I want to thank you for joining us for this episode of the Modern Law Library uh, to talk about prison by any other name. If people are interested in picking up the book or in reaching out to either of you, learning more about these issues, do you have any other people or resources they should be looking at and places that they could find out more about this book, Prison by Any Other Name? Maya, do you want to go first? So I would encourage people to check out a resource called Transform Harm, which looks at both abolition. It's a great collection of resources about abolition, but it also has a lot of information about transformative justice and ways to deal with the type of violence that some people say we have to call the police for, like sexual violence and domestic violence, that type of thing. And that was put together by Project NIA. And there's another great organization people should check out called Creative Interventions that Mm -hmm. has an excellent toolkit that addresses some of these issues of what do you do, which is the question that I think a lot of people are asking. Definitely visiting the Critical Resistance website. I think we'll answer a lot of basic questions about just what is abolition? What is the prison industrial complex? Because of course, it's it's much broader than just prisons themselves. So those are those are a few to start with. And Victoria? So there's a website that was put up recently in the wake of the murder of George George Floyd and the protests that have 
spread across all 50 states, Puerto Rico, D.C., and internationally, called eight to abolition, like the number eight to abolition. And that is a resource to look at what steps can be taken and what abolition is and is not to get to a point where we don't need policing in prisons. And then um, for those who are interested in reading accounts of people who have worked around transformative justice and restorative justice. There is creative interventions, which Maya mentioned, but also uh, Beyond Survival, which is a compilation of transformative justice strategies from people who have been doing this kind of work to address what we do about harm when we're not relying on policing and prisons, both for people who are trying to support other people who have been harmed and from the perspective of people who have done harm, like there's an excellent piece about how to really come to terms with the fact that you've been called out for doing harm to somebody else, because most people's instinctive reaction is to say, I didn't do it, or it wasn't that bad, or, you know, to somehow downplay and dismiss the fact that they have harmed somebody else. And then for people who are thinking about child abuse, particularly child sexual abuse, there's an anthology called Love with Accountability, digging up the roots of child sexual abuse, looking at how to address child sexual abuse in the Black community, which, as we talked about earlier, is often over-policed and overly surveilled and scrutinized by both traditional policing and then institutions such as the child welfare system. So that also, can it's not a... It's not an instruction manual. You can't say like, you know, if I do one, two, and three, this will all magically disappear, but it's a blueprint to what to do when you want to think about addressing harms such as child sexual abuse without, again, relying on these punitive systems that will come in and do a lot more harm. And to the listeners of this episode, by the time you're hearing this, the book Prison by Any Other Name, The Harmful Consequences of Popular Reforms will be available, but I imagine you aren't going to have a traditional book tour given that COVID-19 is out there. Is there any central location where my listeners could find out about virtual events you're having? We're going to have several events in collaboration with bookstores, and those will be listed on both my website mayashanwar.com. And also, Vicky, is your website victorialaw.com? Victorialaw.net. Yes. Okay. For uh, Well, we are having a, a virtual event at the Brooklyn Historical Society on Monday, July 27th, and another virtual event with uh, Beth Ritchie, who is an amazing abolitionist feminist who has done a lot of work around Black women and who have experienced violence, both interpersonal violence and state violence, on Wednesday, August 19th. And it's a virtual event with Women and Children First in Chicago. A fantastic bookstore. Highly recommend. Well, thank you again to Maya Shanwar and Victoria Law for joining us for this episode of the Modern Law Library. And thank you to my listeners for joining us as well. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, review, and subscribe in your favorite podcast listening service.